Sarah. And we miss seeing you all on Sundays. Hope it won't be too much longer until we see you again. Enjoy the meeting. Bye. Hey, Boshe, I'm Kat here. I'm missing you guys. Can't wait to meet in person and worship together. Hope you're staying safe and warm and see you soon. Hi, Hi Boshe. We're the Warwick family. I'm Kurt. I'm Jenny Kate. I'm Eva. And I'm Rachel. <laughs> um, we've missed seeing you all, but we've enjoyed being able to um, see some of you at the Wednesday night citizens conversations, and we look forward to the day when we can all be together again. And our encouragement and prayer for all of you this morning is from Philippians 4, verse 13, and it says... I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Bye. 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 Happy spring. Happy spring. Happy spring. <laughs> Good morning, Bash AM. I'm missing being together so much. Um, my usual seat on a Sunday is at the back with the rest of the sound team. Um, and so I'm especially missing seeing the backs of everyone's heads while we worship together. And I can't wait to go back to that. Um, and yeah, so if this morning you've noticed that uh, everyone greeting uh, has been a staff team member, you're very sharp. Um, and so this is a fresh reminder to please send through your greeting videos. It's such a great way to keep in touch and um, such a great reminder that we are part of a greater community and this isn't just some online video that we're watching. So yeah, please WhatsApp through those videos. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the service. Hello, Common Ground Church. We are Roger and Nikki, and we are so privileged to be walking this Sunday meeting through with you. And what an exciting meeting it is. We realize that for some of you, you're possibly watching church as you always have during this lockdown period on your own, in your home, and we stand with you. But we know that you would be celebrating and cheering on for those who for the first time today are meeting in smaller groups, possibly life groups or groups of friends in homes across the city. What an exciting moment for us as a community. Community. So hello everyone, it's, it's uh, something that I want to speak to is just uh, those of us that are gathering in homes. It's just, uh, I think you're pinching yourself a little bit as you may be looking around and going, wow, we're together uh, again in even just a, a smaller format. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, after sort of five months odd of staring at a screen, uh, you can tend to get into consumer mode a little bit and uh, maybe be tempted to, you know, watch in your pajamas and then maybe even regress into watching in bed or lying on the couch and uh, maybe this moment to just gather is an opportunity for us to reboot and remind ourselves of the privilege of mm. gathering uh, on the Lord's Day to be community and mm. to be church and so I just want to suggest a few things as we move into that. Uh, the one is that we're going to have a, a short time of worship and my suggestion is that we stand together. If you're in a group of people uh, stand together, just set the tone. Mm. Um, it's such a great way of uh, just uh, telling each other that you're intentional about giving God some glory and worship in this time and so stand together the other one is that we're gonna have an opportunity to pray and uh, there I will give you a little bit of a prompt but maybe even now you want to nominate your life group leader or a leader kind of person in the group who when I start praying there'll be a countdown timer you turn the volume down and you're gonna to get to pray uh, in, in your in your home as an opportunity just to personalize this worship experience mm -hmm. uh, we're also suggesting that you uh, as a community and as a group, just lean into the meeting. If you need to stomp your feet or nudge your buddy or do whatever you need to do to engage with the message, just in a way that says, hey, we're really getting this. We're taking it in. We're celebrating the fact that we're hearing God's word preached. Mm. We want to reboot ourselves. I don't know about you, but it, we can tempt to, uh, or be tempted to treat uh, the moment of watching church a bit like maybe a rugby test match. And uh, maybe you miss the haka or you miss the anthems. And we just don't want to be those kind of people. We want to have a strong start and uh, really maximize the couple of minutes that we are together mm. and uh, and really be ready to enjoy all of what it means to worship and so I'm gonna lead us into worship and just remind us of this amazing truth that when Jesus was on the cross mm. and uh, he was bringing salvation for all men it says the temple curtain was torn in two mm. that's a significant thing as we're going into worship together or alone in our homes we need to remind ourselves that the very presence of God has been made available to us. Mm -hmm. As we sing, we don't just sing with another person. We sing with the very 
presence of God with yeah. us. What an amazing privilege. So as we sing, I'm going to pray a prayer. This is your opportunity to uh, turn the volume down. And I'm going to invite the presence of God, that we'd be aware of his grace, his mercy, his kindness that he offered to us as he died on the cross for us, bringing salvation to all of us. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you today, we come to celebrate the fact that you did everything you could to bring us to you. And that was more than enough that we wouldn't just be in your presence, but that we'd be made children of yours. Mm. This amazing day, we pray that you would cause us to see you for who you are, to worship you for the God that you are. We pray that as we, in our various spaces, whether alone or together, the greatest awareness we would have would be of your presence and your power, of your goodness and of your mercy. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Break every chain, oh God. 
with us, God, no matter if we are on our own in our homes or for the first time meeting with friends in smaller groups, you are with us. Thank you for that. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you that even though we are scattered across the city, that we are united as your children, as the body of Christ, as family. Help us as we go into the next part of this meeting. May we um, engage our minds and our hearts as we listen to your word preached. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So hello, as I mentioned, my name is Nikki and it is just so wonderful to have you with us this Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us. If it's your first time visiting us this Sunday, we want to say an especially warm welcome to you. We wish that we could meet you face to face, shake your hand, hand you a warm cup of coffee. But for us to be able to serve you as best we can in this way, wouldn't you fill out a form for us so that we can get your information and connect with you and see how we can serve you and connect you to other spaces and groups in our church or simply answer any questions about us that you might have. The form is linked in the dis in a comment of the description of this video and you can find that while you're watching. We are so um, grateful to have you with us. And then a note to parents with kids, all the links that you might need are also in the description of this video and you can take a moment now to set your family up for the next part of church. One of the really high privileges of following Jesus in a local church community is that we, we don't just get to give of time, uh, talents, but also of our treasures. And a beautiful passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 11, it says this, You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. It's a high privilege that God provides that we might also be generous. And uh, I'm speaking to those of us who consider ourselves uh, members or part of the family in Common Ground Church in the various congregations. And uh, it's an opportunity to give. The giving details are uh, below the screen. And uh, we really do want to thank you, honor you, and uh, just celebrate the amazing ongoing generosity of our community. So much of what we're able to do is because of the generosity of yeah. uh, people like you and us who get to give uh, uh, in and through this community. Mm. We are really looking forward to be hearing from Louise today, who's gonna to be speaking to us on citizens in a hurried world, one of my favorite topics and uh, something that we so desperately need to hear as a culture today. So we're gonna invite Lou to stand with us. Welcome hey Lou, so good to have Welcome you with Louise. us. Nice to see you. And uh, before Lou preaches, we are just gonna take a moment to pray. Thanks. Let's pray. Lord, as we, uh, move towards listening to this word spoken from your scripture. We, we don't just pray for Louise, we pray that we would be able to have um, ears to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. God, that as she speaks out of scripture, you by your spirit would speak to us and uh, speak uh, in, in powerful and beautiful ways mm -hmm. as she speaks. Bless her words and bless our ears as we move into this moment of hearing your word spoken. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Thanks guys. Awesome. Enjoy. Enjoy. Thank you. Hello Common Ground, as mentioned before, I'm Louise and I'm so glad to be with you today as we gather together. A special shout out to those of you who are perhaps joining us for the first time. We really are glad that you are here. Well, we are in a series called Citizens and we are busy exploring what does it mean to be citizens of heaven here on earth. And today we come to week eight. We've touched on some quite big topics so far. We've looked at consumerism and polarization, holiness, mercy, justice. And today we're gonna to look at a super practical topic as we look at what it means to be citizens in a hurried world. And I love the timing of this message. As the lockdown regulations have decreased, as things start opening up again, the pace of life is picking up. And so we're gonna look at what does Jesus and scripture have to teach us? What are the ways and wisdom of God for us, these citizens of heaven living on earth? At the start of 2020, I was introduced to a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Homer. And I immediately resonated with that title because I, perhaps like many of you, um, can immediately acknowledge that life is busy. We are in a hurry. We do live in this kind of frenetic, fast world. Um, in a sense, this is the water that we swim in. It's all around us. The speed, this pace, and the resulting anxiety that we can feel. So we all have the same number of hours that every generation before us has had, and yet it seems like we feel this pressure to do more, to be more, and to cram more in. 
And a number of us have been working through this book and its ideas this year. And in fact, there's so many great resources on this particular topic that we've put together a PDF listing them all. Books, podcasts, articles, even some workbooks that you can work through. And the link to that PDF is in um, the link to this message. So you can really dive into the topic if you want to. But one of the reasons I resonated with this book and its theme so much was a whisper that I felt from God as I came into 2020. And it was this, I'm calling you to depth, not distraction. Depth, not distraction. And in that whisper, I sense something of God's agenda for me and my life. And I think it's something of God's agenda for all of us. So let me take a moment to frame our current space in history, because life hasn't always been this fast and this frantic. And I'm going to just touch on three shifts that have happened. So for centuries, time has been natural, where the sun set the rhythms of work and activity and rest. So think of day and night, think of the seasons. But then in 1370, the first public clock was built in Germany, of course. And this marked a shift in our consciousness. It marked a shift in our relationship to time because the clock introduced the start of artificial time, where nature wasn't setting the rhythm and the pace, but a machine was. Enter electricity. In 1879, the light bulb was introduced. And one of the things this allowed us to do was to stay up beyond sunset. So before this, the average person slept 11 hours a night. Now, the average is seven and a half hours. So that's three and a half hours less every night, which means over the year, we sleep on average about 1,280 hours less. No wonder so many of us feel tired and exhausted and depleted. And then the third shift, let's jump to 2007, the year that the iPhone was released, because this fundamentally shifted the way that we do life. And there've been some fascinating studies that have looked at what the digital age has done to our brains and our concentration and our attention spans. Our capacity for concentration, our capacity for contemplation has been diminished. And the addictive nature of the phone, that compulsion to quickly right now open that email, listen to the voice note, check that message, and quickly go onto Instagram or Facebook to see how many likes you've got. The digital age is designed for addiction and distraction, and it robs us of our time. A US journalist describes it like this. Addiction is the relentless pull to a substance or an activity that becomes so compulsive that it ultimately interferes with everyday life. And all of us can relate to that, that intrusive nature of our devices, which pulls our attention away from the people around us, it pulls our attention away from the moment we're in, it distracts us and it gobbles up our time. Theologian Ronald Rollheiser describes it like this. We live in a climate within which it is difficult not just to think about God or to pray, but simply to have any interior depth whatsoever. We are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. And so this climate can cause us to behave and act just like the people around us. And we become less and less like these capital C citizens and more and more just like everybody else. And so the key question to ask ourselves today is, is the pace I am running at causing me to be more or less like Jesus? Because both sin and busyness have the same effect They cut off our connection, our connection to each other, our connection to God, and our connection to ourselves and our own souls. Whenever I read the Gospels, I'm really struck by the way that Jesus went about his day and his life. Have you noticed that Jesus never seemed to be in a rush? His life is full. There are many demands on his time, but he goes about it in an unhurried way. And so although he has a lot to do, It seems like he doesn't have too much to do. And he will stop to talk to people, to pray with them. He's open to interruptions. He regularly sneaks off to rest and pray. And in fact, a number of times when the disciples are looking for him, they find him sleeping. 
We need to learn from Jesus. Back in week three, Lauren reminded us that as citizens of heaven, we don't reflect the culture, but we reflect our king. So there should be some distinction in how we live and how we spend our time compared to the people around us. If we desire the life of Jesus, we need to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. So today, we're going to look at a period of approximately 24 hours in the life of Jesus. We're going to look at him in action, and we're going to see how did he cope with this full and busy day that he had. We're going back to a passage that we actually preached on earlier in this year, earlier this year during the first part of our Mark series. And when we uh, preached this text back in February, we took an expositional approach to the topic. So if you enjoy that kind of approach, I encourage you to go find it online and listen to it. Because today we're going to tackle the text from a slightly different angle. When we read autobiographies of people that we admire, whether it's a sportsman or someone in business or a celebrity, it's because we hope that by studying that person's life and maybe by emulating or adopting some of their habits and behaviors that will become just like them. And so you'll notice a whole lot of people in the business world who dress in the same outfit every day for simplicity's sake after they read Steve Jobs' autobiography. So in a sense, that's what we're doing today. We're coming to Jesus's life. We're looking at his life. We're looking at his lifestyle because we want to learn from him. And if you're listening in today and you're not yet a believer, maybe you're still exploring who Christ is, then today is going to give you a really good snapshot on the type of person he is and how he goes about his life. So I'm going to pray for us. And then Colin and Cheryl from our Durbanville congregation are going to read today's passage to us. So Father, as we open your word today, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and to speak to us, to touch our minds, to touch our hearts. We want your word to transform us. We want your word to change us. And so teach us something new today, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Common Ground. My name is Colin, and I'm with my wife, Cheryl, and she'll be reading our scripture for this morning. Morning, Common Ground. I'll be reading from Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 35. And the heading goes like this. Jesus drives out an impure spirit. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to, into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teacher of the law. Just then a man in a synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus Stanley. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all are so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirit and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left and she began to wait on them. That evening after the sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon, and the demon possessed. The whole town gathered uh, at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he will not let demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Amen. We're going to use this passage to look at two things that we can learn from the life of Jesus, two kind of handles to hold on to that are going to help us live in a way that's more unhurried. So we have two big ideas, how to start your week right and how to start your day right. And just so you know what to expect, I'm going to spend a chunk of my time on that first one, and then I'm only going to touch on the second one briefly. 
And the reason I want to focus on these two habits or practices is because they will have a disproportionate impact on our lives if we do them well. These two habits can really help us. They can really shape us. And they are timeless habits, but I also sense that they are timely habits for us today. Because in this COVID season of stretch and strain, and in this unique time now of almost like re-entering life, where we get to decide afresh what we are saying yes to and what we are saying no to, if we get these two things right, they really allow us to draw close to God and to hear His voice more clearly and to draw closer to Him as the source. So let's start by looking at how to start your week right. In verse 21, we read, when the Sabbath day came. So let's explore this concept of the Sabbath. The word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to stop. The Sabbath is the day to stop, to stop working, to stop worrying, to stop wanting. Sabbath is the day to be with God, where we move from this place of kind of relentlessness in our busyness and our work and our activity, and we move to a place of restfulness, where we rest in God, we rest in His presence and His provision. And built into the life of Jesus was the habit of Sabbath, an entire day every week to rest and to slow down and to stop. If we go back to Exodus 20, we read this. It's the fourth commandment. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And verse eight calls us to remember, remember the Sabbath because we are forgetful. And there's something about the human condition that almost makes us want to hurry through life. And we know we tend to get preoccupied and distracted by many things. And so God actually has to command us and has to remind us to do this very thing, to Sabbath to stop, to rest. And Sabbath reflects the very posture of God because he, even though he is infinite and all powerful, he still set aside time to rest and to delight in what he had created. It says he rested on the seventh day. God rested. Even though he didn't need to, God rested. And in doing so, he built a rhythm into the DNA of creation. Six days to work and on the seventh day to rest. So it's part of the design of creation to help us flourish and to help us thrive. So this word Shabbat, it means to stop and to cease, but it also means to celebrate, to delight in, to delight in God, to delight in His creation, to delight in our lives in His world. Sabbath is this holy day of rest and worship because it's holy. Verse 10 says, it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It's set apart for God. It's dedicated to God. So it's this day of delighting, of worship. And that definition of worship extends to all things that help me delight in God. Anything which moves my heart to that place of awe and gratitude. Maybe it's people, maybe it's places that help me to express and experience that God is real and that God is good. So Sabbath is wonderful. So what makes it so difficult? Why do we struggle to implement and embrace this weekly rhythm? Remember, we're citizens of heaven, but we're on earth. And so there's a number of factors that are fighting against this. And I wanna to touch on just two today. The first factor is this prevailing mindset that exists in our culture, aided by technology. And it's the idea that you need to be always on and always accessible. And so as a result, we feel we can't switch off. We have to keep busy. We have to keep moving. We have to achieve and accomplish and accumulate. And we have to be available to whoever needs us whenever they need us. 
And so Sabbath is difficult because we're fighting this mindset. And so we struggle to switch off. We struggle to switch off our phone. We struggle to switch off ourselves. We struggle to rest. And we easily default to being a human doing rather than a human being. The second factor that makes Sabbath so difficult is what I call alternative Sabbath options. These are good things. They're often even great things, but they tend to put me and my desires at the center. And Cape Town is full of amazing Sabbath alternatives. The beach, the mountain, the outdoors, uh, marathons, markets, the mall, builder's warehouse, you know, all of these things in and of themselves, they're not bad, but they replace the true purpose of the day. Our culture is full of ideas about the ideal weekend and wants to shape how we spend our weekend, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, what we give our attention to. The Sabbath should set the week up. We begin the week in Sabbath, in rest and celebration. We put God first and it sets up the whole rest of the week. But our modern culture has inverted that. So Sabbath is the last priority. It's the first thing that gets encroached upon. And this rhythm of putting God first in everything has culturally slipped to putting God into last place or maybe just trying to cram him and fit him in if there's space. In Isaiah 58, we're reminded, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way, and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. So let's look at what Jesus did on his Sabbath. In this passage in Mark, I want to touch on three elements that we see in Jesus's Sabbath. It says, when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue. So Jesus had this weekly rhythm of going to the synagogue. That's how he began his day. He gathered with God's people, with God's word. That was his pattern. The Greek uh, term for church is ecclesia, which means those assembled, those gathered together in worship. And we haven't been able to gather as the church in the usual way for the past few months. And we are longing to be together. And part of the reason that we long for it is because it's part of our design as heavenly citizens. Because when we gather, we experience the presence of God in our kind of gathered worship and we experience the presence of each other in this physical community around us. So at the moment, we know that maybe it looks a bit different, it feels different, but we're moving towards gathering together physically again. Whether it's in smaller groups, in homes, maybe you're gathering as life groups to participate in the online meeting together. We are people designed to gather, to be together in community, to gather as a priority and as a pattern. And so let's keep doing that. Let's keep that priority and that pattern as we see Jesus doing, whether we're doing that in person or online. Jesus also seems to be open to interruption. He's open to what is happening around him. So he wants to help this man who's possessed by these demons. And he reaches out to help Simon's mother-in-law when he realizes that she's ill. He is touching the people around him, bringing them healing physically and spiritually. And that's the second thing I notice, his other-centeredness. I think one danger is that we can use our Sabbath quite selfishly. You know, what is going to fill and replenish and restore me? And yes, that's, that's important, but it's not about putting ourselves at the center. Sabbath is not simply this day to build around ourselves. So here we see Jesus using his Sabbath day to make a massive difference in the people around him. Sabbath isn't a privatized thing that is just for our own soul's flourishing. I wonder how Jesus' example of an other-focused life could start to shape what we do and what we give ourselves to on our Sabbath. Maybe it could shape how we serve and how we contribute and participate in a Sunday meeting. Maybe it shapes how we respond to people around us, how we include people in our Sabbath. I love how the theologian Walter Brueggemann puts it. He says, Sabbath is the refusal to let one's life be defined by production and consumption and the endless pursuit of private well-being. 
And then the third element, I've called this the things that delight because there's this beautiful gap in the story. It says the fever left her, she began to wait on them. And then it says that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. So there's this gap. There's hours between the healing and after sunset. And in that gap, I can imagine Jesus doing a number of things. Maybe he went for a walk. Maybe he went for a swim in the ocean. I can see him enjoying a leisurely meal with his disciples. Simple food, rich conversation, lots of laughter. Can you picture it? And maybe there's even space and time for that most glorious thing of all, an afternoon nap. I remember being struck when I read John Ortberg's book about spiritual disciplines that he said, sometimes going for a nap can be the best spiritual discipline because it makes me more like Jesus than anything else could. And so we learn from Jesus. And I wanna ask you to think about what it could look like for you to start celebrating the Sabbath more. Think about what 24 hours of rest and celebration and worship could look like for you. What is a day of relaxing into God's goodness look like? Would it include a long leisurely meal with friends or with family? A walk in the forest or on the beach, perhaps going for a run because Getting into nature and creation seems to be a key way for many of us to feel that connection with our creator and to be replenished. Maybe it's reading a good book, singing, painting, dancing. For married couples, could it include celebrating intimacy and making love? If you think about Sabbath as stopping, what do you need to stop? What invitations or opportunities do you need to say no to? Is it no to kiddies' birthday parties or to marathons or to sports tournaments? Perhaps it's saying no to your device and turning off your phone or your laptop for a full day. Perhaps it's saying no to work creep, where you end your work week off well and decisively so that you can actually change gear. If you think about Sabbath as celebration, what do you need to celebrate more of? Maybe it's people or places that help you celebrate, Maybe it's been more inclusive in your Sabbath experience. What does it look like to Sabbath as an individual, as a family, as a community? There's no formula, there's no checklist, there's not even a set day that you have to Sabbath on because we don't live in the kind of rigidness and legalism of the Old Testament. No, we live under Jesus in the freedom of the New Testament Sabbath. So it's more about the posture, the essence, the spirit of the Sabbath that we're trying to practice. And everyone is different. We're in different seasons and stages. We're all wired differently. We all replenish differently. But because of the culture around us, celebrating Sabbath requires intentionality and it requires planning. So perhaps you want to pre-cook some food or make sure that you've done all your shopping beforehand so that you can avoid the shops. Or you want to invite people ahead of time to come and join you in an aspect of your Sabbath. Let me share with you some real life examples from common grounders across the city. So one family I know in our South Penn congregation, they brought back the roast dinner to to their Sabbath because that slow way of cooking, that kind of feasting together, it really ignited that sense of celebration and delight for them. So maybe it's bringing out the poiki pot because that's another way to slow things down. Another family I know went the complete opposite. They have eggs for supper because it's the simplest, quickest meal that they can make. A single guy in Bosch PM begins his Sabbath every day, every week by waking up early. And then he goes for a walk up the mountain with two of his mates to watch the sunrise. Because being in God's creation, being in that quiet of the morning helps to stir their faith. And then they go for breakfast together. And in fact, uh, this is a pic he took last week on his walk, which he sent to me because we've been chatting about how we Sabbath well. Another lady from Bosch AM shared how as a single person, having the freedom to prioritize how she spends her time means that she will often spend the first few hours of her Saturday morning praying and processing. She reflects and she journals the things that she feels like God has been saying. And that unrushed time allows her to hear and respond to God. There's a family in Bosch AM who have a special dinner on Friday night. They all dress up smartly and the kids take it in turns to choose the menu. And they begin the meal by lighting some candles and they ask, what are we stopping? 
We stop in school, we stop in work, we stop in being distracted by our devices and they put their devices away. And then they ask, what are we celebrating? And they use that as an opportunity to reflect on God's goodness, God's provision to them over the previous week and to practice contentment, being grateful for the enough that we have. John Mark Homer, he describes it like this, and he's a pastor, so remember, Sunday's a working day for him, and so he Sabbaths on a Friday. He says, just before sunset on Friday, we finish up all our to-do lists and homework and grocery shopping and responsibilities. We power down all our devices, we literally put them all in a box and stow it in a closet, and we gather around the table as a family. We open a bottle of wine, light some candles, read a psalm, pray. Then we feast, and we basically don't stop feasting for the next 24 hours. We sleep in Saturday morning, drink coffee, read our Bibles, pray more, spend time together, talk, laugh. In summer, walk to the park. In winter, make a fire. Get lost in good novels on the couch, cuddle, nap, make love. Honestly, I spend a lot of time just sitting by the window, being. And something happens about halfway through the day, something hard to put language to. It's like my soul catches up to my body, like some deep part of me that got beat up and drowned out by meetings and email and Twitter and relational conflict and the difficulty of life comes back to the surface of my heart and I feel free. And as for me, as for the Gibbon family, how do we do it? I think we're still very much in a trial and error stage of figuring it out. But our Sabbath usually starts Saturday lunchtime because we use Saturday morning to do chores, to get things done. And before lockdown, a lot of our sporting activity was happening on a Saturday morning. And then we begin with a braai. And that braai at Saturday lunchtime usually signals the shift and the change that things are starting to slow down. We're four very different people. We're very unique. We're all kind of replenished in different ways. And so we really are learning how to accommodate each other and how to ensure that all of us feel replenished at the end of that um, day. We definitely don't get it right every week. There've been many weeks where we haven't got it right. Some are better than others, but we really want to keep trying because we know that it's about practice, not performance. And it's about practice, not perfection. So we just need to keep practicing. And before I end this point, I want to speak quickly to those of you who perhaps you're nodding along, you know, as I'm speaking and you're nodding along because you think, oh, this is, these are great ideas. But you know deep down that you actually aren't going to change anything and you aren't going to implement any of this. Or there's those of you who are thinking, oh, but Louise, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand my situation. You don't understand the season I'm in. You don't understand the burden and the weight that I'm carrying. And I know that for many people, this season has added a whole lot of responsibilities and and weight to our lives. But I want to remind all of us that the gospel message is an invitation to rest. Because at the core of the gospel is this idea that it doesn't depend on you, on what you have done or what you are going to do. No, at the core of the gospel is this invitation to rest in the work of Jesus, in what he has done on the cross. And so rest and Sabbath reminds us of that truth. It's not about us. We get to rest in Jesus. So rest is in our DNA. It's in our design as capital C citizens. And we get to practice our capital C citizenship by resting, by stopping. So maybe your take home today is to think about how do you create a day that cultivates rest, that cultivates celebration as an expression and a reminder of gospel truth. So let's move on. And as I mentioned, my next point will be much shorter. Let's look at how to start our day right. Verse 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now remember what had happened the night before. The people had brought to Jesus all the sick, all the demon possessed. The whole town had gathered at the door and Jesus had healed many. I can imagine that going on for hours. So if there was ever a good excuse to sleep in, Jesus had it. But Jesus shows mind over mattress and he points to another spiritual discipline, another habit, another practice. Here we see Jesus up early, out the door, into the quiet place. 
And this is something that we'll see time and time again. Jesus withdrawing from people to be with his father, to pray and to hear from his father. The quiet place was a priority for Jesus. And over and over again in the gospels, we read things like, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He says to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So as Jesus gets busier and more in demand, the more he withdraws and takes time to be quiet and to pray. And usually for us, it's the exact opposite. As life gets hectic, as the schedule gets fuller, as more and more people are demanding things from us, the quiet place is usually the first to go, not the first go to. But Jesus chose again and again to give his first and best moments of the day to seeking his father's face. Well, how does your day start? What do you give your first and best moments to? I think for many of us, the hurry of the day starts first thing. The alarm goes off, we're getting kids ready for school, we're preparing for work, answering urgent messages on our phone. Then we hit the traffic. The day begins in noise and bustle and go. Jesus did it differently. He went to the quiet place first. What happens in in the quiet? We sit, we read the Bible, we pray, we think and reflect. We ask the Holy Spirit to speak and to work. We pay attention to God. We foster our connection with him and we allow his voice to be loudest. And again, it's something to practice. We're not just gonna drift into this discipline. Remember the stat, it takes 10,000 hours for someone to move to expert status in a skill. So that means if you practice something for an hour a day, it's gonna take you about 27 years. So don't stress if your time this morning or yesterday wasn't that great. Just keep practicing. It's not so much about each individual time being amazing. It's more that over the weeks, over the months, over the years, these are the rhythms, these are the habits that really shape and shift us in significant ways. How do you begin your day? What's the first thing that you go to? 75% of people sleep next to their phones and 90% of us check our phones immediately upon waking. How's this for a quote from John Mark Homer? He says, do not let your phone set your equilibrium and your newsfeed set your view of the world. Let prayer set your emotional equilibrium and scripture set your view of the world. Begin your day in the spirit of God's presence and the truth of his scriptures. Again, this looks different to everyone. Everyone's in a different season, in a different situation. There's a couple in our inner city congregation who have young kids. So they set the alarm for 5.45 a.m. so that they can be up and awake before them. Now that's a sacrifice. It'd be easier to sleep in and to just wake up with the kids into the chaos of family life. But they intentionally want to start the day in in a more unhurried way, in a quieter way, in prayer and in scripture. And the only way to do that is to be up before those kids. An older man, I know, parents his phone. So he puts his phone to bed before him and he makes it sleep in. And he also keeps it off and on the other side of the house and he won't switch it on until he's had his time with God. Someone else I know ensures that her day begins with a cup of tea. And that tea is a prompt for quiet and for prayer, to think about the day, to pray through the day, And then she looks at the news headlines, not to be distracted, but in order to pray through what is happening in the world. And to the moms out there, I know you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, this is impossible. So I was inspired the other day by the story of Susanna Wesley. She was born in the 1600s and she had 19 children um, of whom John Wesley was the 15th, Charles Wesley the 18th, these kind of giants in the faith. And she had a difficult life. She wasn't wealthy. Her husband was twice imprisoned for fraud and nine of her children, including two sets of twins, died in infancy. So she has this busy life raising 10 children and yet she manages to keep her faith and to pray every day. So where was her place of prayer? There was nowhere that she could go to escape from this busy household. And so whenever she wanted time with God, She brought her Bible to her favorite chair. She sat down and she threw her long apron up over her head. 
And everyone in the household knew to respect the signal that when she was under the apron, she was with God and she was not to be disturbed except in the case of extreme emergency. So moms, I know it's a full and busy season, but I wonder what is your expression of the apron? Where do you draw away? Where are you uninterruptible? These two lessons from Jesus, how to start our day right, how to start our week right. We are citizens of heaven living in this very hurried world. It can be a hamster wheel. It can be almost this treadmill of activity. But as citizens of heaven, we're invited to follow a very different rhythm and a very different pace. We're invited to this unhurried life where we get to slow down. We get to stop. We get to rest. We get to embrace that we are human. And so we are finite and limited. And we embrace those limits. So we don't have to do everything. We don't have to be everywhere. We don't have to be everyone to everyone. We're invited to live from this place of peace and contentment. And so I want to land by going back to the Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke is this piece of equipment that brings two creatures into alignment. As they walk together, as they work together, the yoke enables them to walk at the same speed. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to hear. He's saying, come, along, come alongside me, align with me and match your pace to mine. Learn from me, follow my pattern, follow my pace of life. Jesus isn't inviting us to an easy life. He's inviting us to this easy yoke, where as we match our pace with his, he can give us the resources that we need to carry the burdens and the weights and the responsibilities of our lives. If we want the life of Jesus, we have to embrace the lifestyle of Jesus. And so I want to read those verses again, but this time from the message, because it puts it like this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. We're going to close today's message with the band singing a song. And I invite you to respond how you need to. Maybe you want to stand and sing along. Maybe you want to take some time to think about, reflect, maybe even journal, whatever you sense God is saying to you. If you, um, with a group of people in your home, you might even want to chat through what you feel like God is highlighting for you today. But let's respond to God today together. Things like you 
Thank you so much, Lou, for serving us so well. That was an amazing message. And uh, we can't wait to have you with us next week. Uh, we've got Luke speaking on uh, uh, citizens in a world of endless opportunity. And my goodness, do we need to hear this one? Mm. And uh, maybe you're just thinking of yourself needing to be there, but we never want to forget the people in our communities, in our lives, who we could invite uh, yeah. to join us. Let's keep that invitational culture up. There's so many people who need to hear these messages. Yeah. Before we look at some next steps for today in our separate congregations, we want to invite you to... Um, download a gift from us to you. If you're new to the faith or simply you want to just spark um, a new fresh love for the Bible, we have the Ignite booklet, a 31 day journey into the Bible. You can download the PDF. The link is in the description of this video. We would love you to go and grab that. But thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so wonderful to have you and we will see you next week. Have a wonderful Sunday. Good morning, Bashim. Hey, Bashim. We are Mike and Jane. We're part of the leadership team here, and we get to share the announcements with you this Sunday. Firstly, I just want to say a big thank you to Lou, one of mm. our very own, who just preached such an amazing sermon. Wow, Lou, you have challenged me on what does it mean to take it slow in such a busy, fast-paced sure. world, and I've got a lot to think about, about how I'm going to set up my days and my weeks well. So thank you for serving us in this way. Yeah, thanks, Lou. And uh, you may be new, so welcome to you if you are. And we'd love to be in touch with you. There's a form that can be filled in in the link in the description below. So won't you fill that in and uh, we'll be in touch and hopefully uh, uh, help you to feel a bit more connected to us. And then um, we also have a pastoral line uh, that uh, you can get in touch with as well. There's a phone number there. There's also a form that you could fill in if you prefer that. Um, if you want one of our pastors to get in touch with you, to give you a phone call. We know these are strange, difficult times and uh, you're not alone. So reach out to us. We'd love to be in touch. Now, you can hear some jingling in the background. Some noise. That's Hannah on the floor. And so just to keep it real, have a look below to see what's happening. Great, so it might look all professional up here, but uh, guys, let's keep That's it real. That's the reality. <laughs> it's messy down below. Um, so at least you get a little bit of an insight into what does it mean to actually shoot the announcements. So we get to do the announcements, and for this week, we are going with the theme of hats. So Come we're going to wear a different hat for every announcement, starting with our cowboy hat. All right, there we go. Okay. So this hat represents a journey and as a congregation, as a community, we've been on a journey around what does it mean to really prioritize prayer. Yeah. Prayer is so important to us, to God. It's something that Jesus modeled to us beautifully. And so we want to be a community that's digging into prayer. And so we've had weekly prayer meetings that we've been inviting you to. Mm -hmm. They've been happening twice a day because of lockdown and everything was a bit slower. Mm. But as we've realized now, level two, life's going a little bit back to normal. We've realized actually two prayer meetings might not necessarily serve us well, especially the evening meeting where kids are needing to be fed and things can be a little bit crazy, finishing off work. And so we're consolidating to one prayer meeting on a Tuesday, yeah. starting this Tuesday. So from this week, there is no evening prayer meeting. There's only one meeting in the morning at half past seven. Yeah. And we really want to encourage you please come we've been leading the Tuesday morning prayer meetings it is such an amazing rich time yeah. of seeking God and asking him just to be within us and to be serving the city and helping us to serve the city so please won't you come and be part of those prayer meetings and, and also to encourage you that if you can be there for 15 minutes or 20 minutes of that half an hour time do that uh, we don't feel bad in any way if you need to jump off to go and get ready for work or get the kids set up or whatever you need to do so uh, join us for a little bit we'd love to see you there Great. All right, that's the one hat, the next hat. Uh, this is an ode to our friend Jono. Um, he has I feel, a frequency. I he feel, looks much better I in a cat than we my, do. My, my ears stick out horribly <laughs> in, in hats, uh, which is why I don't wear them. But Jono, this one's for you. Uh, but we're here to speak about next gen. You know, under level two, there is a bit more freedom of what we can uh, do. So we want to speak about Kids Rock Ignite and frequency and what it looks like 
uh, in the next little bit. So for Kids Rock, we're actually going to remain the same. There's still going to be Sunday videos. There's going to be your weekly devotions and all that sort of stuff. So uh, look out for that. Um, but for Ignite? So Ignite, you are not going to be doing a Friday evening event, but actually what we've realized is that we really want opportunities to connect with one another mm. and just see each other face to face yeah. for the preteens. So Sunday content will be the same, but Ignite is launching um, get togethers. So yeah. it's going to be time where the um, Ignite preteens can get together in different open spaces. And so the kickoff is on the 19th of September. That is two weeks time on a Saturday. They'll be meeting at Kirbin Park all together. Um, parents, you will get this information through the Ignite broadcast mm. list, but we just wanted to share the heart behind this. We've yeah. realized that kids are zoomed out. <laughs> they don't want to see another out. person <laughs> yeah. on a screen. And so we're trying to create opportunity for them to connect with their friends yeah. face to face, but we can assure you that our Ignite leaders will be there and there will be appropriate sanitization procedures so your children will All be safe, <laughs> but they'll be able to have lots of fun. So please, won't you just save the date, 19th of September, Kilburn Park, Igniters, we're ready for you. Great. And then I just want to update you as to what's happening with frequency. So we've made the decision to stop sending out the frequency videos on Sunday. And so we encourage you as families, as parents, as high schoolers to dial in together, worship together, sit under the word together. There will be connection moments over the over WhatsApp and so on with the frequency leaders, with Jono and Kelly. So there is still a touch point on Sundays, but the focus is going to be Friday evenings. I think what we've realized is that as, as high schoolers and you know teens and preteens are, are missing that connection with their leaders and with their friends and so to have it live on a Friday evening as it's been uh, happening they've just finished Alpha and they're going to move, be moving into a new series now coming up and uh, that's going to be the focus so look out for that and also there will hopefully be some opportunity uh, similar to Ignite with yeah. opportunities to get together in the park for a walk on the beach for a coffee all those sorts of things again all that communication will go out on the uh, platforms that frequency use and uh, yeah, look out for that but we super excited for our next gen ministries and opportunities to actually connect with real people rather than just watching something on screen so look out for that whether you've been navigating zoom calls with colleagues bosses or teachers homeschooling your kids being homeschooled wondering why you had kids in the first place why do you need to do online school learning technology you didn't know existed filming yourself recording yourself working on friendships online trying to date via technology taking on new roles leaving old roles looking for work working long hours lockdown has changed challenged grown and fatigued all of us we want to invite all ladies to a girls night in for some fun spot prizes laughing at some of our staff as well as some truth and inspiration from our guest speakers Lucinda Mashua and Rachel Khaleesi join us on Wednesday the 16th of September at 7 30 for a great evening of connecting together Great. So as you can see, we're very excited for our ladies event. So that's happening on Wednesday, the 16th of September from 7.30 till 9 o'clock. There'll be Zoom details that are sent out to mm. you. Um, two things to remind you of. Number one, please won't you bring along a sweet treat and something warm to drink just so that you can feel like you're, we're all part of it, drinking and eating together. And then secondly, won't you wear something colorful? We just wanted to see pops of color on the screen mm. just to liven up our days, make it feel warm and colorful and bright. So a colorful scarf or some flowers in your hair something to just bring along to that night but i can't wait to see you there that sounds beautiful and uh, that's it from us Bosch AM. and so if you need any of these details they will be in the mailer so check that out otherwise have a fantastic week see you at the prayer meeting on tuesday morning otherwise god bless bye, bye.